All right, everybody, we are going to get started. Thank you so much for joining today. My name is Evan Weinberg, and I am a member of the VTC uh, organizing committee, a co-host co of this workshop. Saigon South International School is honored to be hosting the ninth annual Vietnam Tech Conference in collaboration with Eunice. Uh, it's all my honor and introduce Heidi McGregor, who's going to speak with us about uh, how a little idea turned into a multimedia global extravaganza in our workshop today. Heidi McGregor, K-5 through STEM integration specialist for Littleton Public Schools in Littleton, Massachusetts. Prior to this, she taught grade for 10 years at Russell Street Elementary School. She's a makerspace and global education enthusiast and is always looking for new and exciting ways to amplify student voice. She serves on the MassQ Directors, the MassQ Influence and Advocacy Committee, and leader of the MassQ Makerspace uh, Interest Group. And then she is a co-founder of the Middlesex Scratch. Welcome, Heidi McGregor. You're on, Heidi. Thanks. Okay. Can everybody can hear me okay? I'm hoping. Great. <laughs> It's great to be here. Um, I was just going to say tonight, what's morning where you are, it is Friday evening at 10 p.m. for me right now. Um, I'd like to talk to you about um, this project, um, about how a little idea turned into a global extravaganza. That sounds very grandiose, I know. <laughs> um, but um, thank you, Evan, for the um, nice in introduction. Um, I am Heidi McGregor. Um, I think you guys heard uh, about me a little bit. Um, I am on Twitter, so I love to connect with people on Twitter. So um, please do follow me at Mrs. McGregor 206. Um, and I would love to connect with um, all of you online. Um, I checked out um, some of the people um, who signed up to attend this session, and it looks like we have a lot of elementary um, folks here today, which is great, because um, that is my area of, of, of expertise. Um, so anyway, I, um, I just want to let you know that um, throughout this session, I am going to share a pretty specific activity that I did, a pretty a specific project, um, but I know that you as professionals with your unique students in front of you um, will be able to sort of um, apply these strategies um, and these thoughts to your own specialty area. Um, this is not intended to be a cookie cutter um, replicable project. In fact, I've tried to replicate parts of this project before and it always comes out different. Um, so it's not something that you can just kind of like um, copy and do it exactly the same way. Um, but I really believe um, that um, this project that I'm going to talk to you about was transformative, not just for my classroom and my learners in my classroom, um, but also for me. Um, this is something I did about three years ago, um, and it still impacts my daily work three years later. Um, but really, it all comes down for me about student engagement. Um, and I believe that engagement is when students deeply internalize their academic experiences in a meaningful way that impacts their viewpoint and intrinsically motivates them to keep at it. It's not structured on compliance or going along without making waves good. I really believe that it's deeper than that. And I, as a teacher, I see myself um, role really is to influence student engagement. Um, and this project that I'm going to talk to you about is that I realized um, as we got going with this, that it was not just about my students being engaged, but I needed the engagement as much as they did. I felt like it was exciting. It made me excited to be a teacher. It made me excited to see them learning. Um, and I really needed to know that what I do makes a difference and can light the fire of these learners. Um, so it definitely was transformative for me as an educator professional. 
which honestly I think is relevant whether we're in a pandemic or not, quite honestly. <laughs> So the name of the project that my students and I did together, this multimedia global project, was called Great Book Reviews. Um, and I'll talk about that name a little bit later as well. Um, but the students like to call GBR, that was a name for it, GBR. Um, and I thought I would start at, at the end before I broke it down and explained what we did. So I want to share with you a short video. It's just, just under two minutes long. Um, and this video was recorded um, uh, about a year after this project. My first students uh, who had been in my fourth grade classroom, so in this video, they are now fifth graders. Um, they were out at recess and um, they wanted to talk to me um, about the impact that this project had on them. Um, so I'm just going to, hopefully this will play correctly for you. Yeah, Heidi, I'm not sure if the, the audio or the video is coming through, so I just put the the link into the chat. If you want to watch it yourself, you can see. The okay, thank you. I um, was wondering if it was working or not, so um, yeah, you can watch it later if you would like. Okay. Um, so, so hopefully you caught a little bit of a glimpse of the excitement that um, the students had um, about talking about um, this project that they had done um, the year before. Um, so now I want to back up and go way back to the beginning and how this, this project actually started and, and where it came from. So um, as, a, a, as a classroom teacher, one of the things I struggle with continually over 10 years of teaching fourth grade was how could I encourage students to read independently at home? You know, how do, how do you get them to do that reliably. Um, and reading logs just never really sat well with me, um, even though that was something that was common practice amongst my colleagues in our school. It was just kind of expected the kids would get a paper um, and they would jot down how many minutes they read each night. Um, but I, it just never really worked for me. So I experimented with all different activities to promote reading um, and try to find ways to, you know, hold kids accountable for doing that important um, literacy work that they need to be doing outside of school. Um, but the same thing we spent over and over and over again was that the kids who loved to read did it because it inspired me. They didn't even need me to encourage them. Um, but the students who didn't love to read would, would kind of fake it. You know, they they would say that they were reading at home, but they maybe maybe they just weren't really really getting into it. Um, so my big picture goal was to how could I make at home reading be more motivating? And that was um, that was how this that was my little idea that started. Um, so as I start thinking about this, you know, it really came down to kind of three. Um, I don't know, uh, like pillars of thought um, that really um, that really made a difference in this. Um, one thing was was trust. 
um, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that, authentic audience and the SAMR model. Um, so, so what I mean by trust, like why did trust make such a, a take set up such a big role here is that um, I really felt like I was taking a leap by moving away from like traditional at home reading models. Um, and I really had to start thinking, um, like trusting that I could step away from our standard curriculum a little bit, I could um, you know, try to use um, some of the maker mindset, you know, allowing students to sort of cultivate their own thinking and, and drive their own learning. Um, and I could take this leap with my students and trust um, that um, when we put the learning in the hands of our students, that we as the educators in the room will be able to guide them while keeping a learning goal at the forefront. I think sometimes um, we teachers can be intimidated when we just sort of release control to the students, thinking that it's just going to be overwhelming and a little bit of chaos and just unable to sort of rein it in and make sure that learning is actually going in the direction that it needs to be going. Um, so that's, that's, that was a big piece of this, is that I had to take that leap of faith. Um, and then from with in the terms of the authentic audience, um, I don't know if you've noticed this with uh, with your students, but um, a few years ago, I started noticing that um, my students and my young students, we're talking nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds, um, were talking about their favorite YouTubers all the time. Um, and then they started saying that they want to be a famous YouTuber. <laughs> Um, so I started to get kind of curious around that, you know, I was wondering, like, and listening to the kids talk about this stuff, and I'm thinking, you know, I wonder if um, I can sort of leverage this desire for kids to have this um, YouTube global audience, um, and sort of, um, you know, capitalize on that a little bit in order to sp inspire more reading. Um, so basically, my students were telling me that they valued connections, not just with me, but with the world through their YouTube subscribers, whether they had a lot of YouTube subscribers or not, it really didn't matter. It's just that the students really wanted to have that opportunity to show themselves to the world. Um, there's also so much research that points to the value of authentic audience for students. So I thought, all right, why not, why not just um, jump in and let this happen? Um, and since this is a, a tech conference, we need to talk about um, the SAMR model and how that played a role in this project. Um, at the time when this project was really unfolding, I would say that true technology integration in my school was still emerging. You know, we were still trying to figure out how we wanted to use technology effectively. Um, we didn't have that many devices. Our internet was not always um, the fastest or the, uh, you know, the most reliable. Um, so um, when I started using educational technology in my classroom, I wanted to be really strategic about it. Um, and this model really helped me frame um, how I was using technology. Um, so I know that that um, even in our keynote um, earlier this morning, um, this this same graphic uh, showed up. So I'm sure this is something that you all are familiar with. Um, but um, you know, trying to stay, um, I mean, the substitution level of technology, we're all doing that now in the COVID pandemic lifestyle of teaching. Um, and definitely augmentation is happening. Um, but I really wanted to take this time to, um, with my students, really get into that redefinition. Um, I wanted to make it, um, it just incredibly, I wanted to transform their experiences. So to pull off this great book reviews project, uh, we used a lot of different things. So a combination of Google Classroom, um, which at the time was something that none of my students had ever used before, um, which is kind of funny now. I don't know what models, what um, LMS you're using now for your um, COVID uh, pandemic teaching, but Google Classroom is now mainstream 
in my school. Uh, Google Docs, Google Drawings, we used Twitter, we used Seesaw, YouTube, Flipgrid, iMovie, GarageBand, Final Cut Pro, QR codes, um, and then just the regular stuff like paper crayons and markers, um, because I really do believe that kids need to have that balance where they can create um, with not just technology tools, but also um, things they are more physical, um, physical um, things. So the first step in our process was I, I went to my students and I asked them this essential question. Um, I said, how can we share our love of books and reading with the world? Um, and that was something that I put out there. And we started it off as a very small discussion. Um, and then I ended up posting, let's see if it let me load this up. So I ended up posting this little form. It's not beautiful, it's not elegant, um, but I asked the students to fill in everything that they could on this form. They didn't have to um, fill it all in, um, just whatever they could come up with. I really wanted them to just brainstorm wild and crazy ideas of how they could share their love of books ending with the world. Um, so you can see the first line on here was what they thought the name of the project should be. And in my head, I kind of pictured we would have, you know, some really flashy name or, you know, something that, you know, was, um, you know, like really eloquent. <laughs> um, but the students, um, they generated the name and they had um, some uh, very spicy debates over what the name should be. And it ended up being that great book reviews um, was the name that they wanted. So that was what we went with. Um, we also did some brainstorming about how we would share our work with the world. Um, I gave them some choices. Um, and it's funny because they actually chose pretty much everything. They wanted to share in every possible way. Um, I had them um, think about who our audience would be, how we would tell people about it so we could get the word out. Um, how, now this was my teacher brain thinking. I asked the students, how can we make our book reviews high quality? Uh, I didn't want this to turn into just, um, you know, something to pass the time. I wanted it to be meaningful and have a, have a deeper learning experience. Um, and then I asked them what they personally wanted to do to help our project succeed. succeed. Like how, were, how did each individual student feel that they would be able to contribute to this? Um, and then I asked them what other ideas they might have. Um, and then the second step, I'm calling it step two, um, we discussed everything. So I already said we had a, a very hearty debate about the name. Um, we talked about YouTube. We talked about um, how we could use Twitter to amplify our work. Um, we talked about blogs. Um, we even have a local cable television network in our town where we live. Um, so I mentioned that if they were interested in that, they could actually um, air their work on television if they wanted to. Um, and I basically just took everything they wanted to do and I just said yes to everything. That was a little scary, <laughs> but I did it. I just said yes to everything and I accepted, uh, I took that leap of faith. I trusted in the process that it would work out. So then what we did is once we once we figured out what we were what we were going to do, I wanted to make sure that every student had a unique way to participate. I didn't want um, anyone to feel like this wasn't their project, that it was just somebody else's work. I wanted us all to do this as a team. So I ended up um, with the students together. We made this this, um, this little table. It's not fancy. Um, and we, we, we capitalized on the things that students wrote um, in that form, especially the part about what they personally thought they could bring to this project. So I found out that I had students who were really passionate about art. I had students who were really passionate about their skills with music. 
Um, and I had kids that were really strong and passionate about how they how they were as readers um, and writers. Um, so we decided that we were going to have a group who would design an actual logo. Um, and that that logo would be used on um, YouTube and the the TV show that they decided they wanted to do. And they made paper posters as well that we hung up um, around the school, at the local grocery store, at the local library. We hung those posters everywhere. <laughs> um, and then we had a, um, another group that created a banner, uh, a banner image, and I, I'll show you that image later. Um, and they decided they wanted to use Google Drawings to make their banner. Um, and then um, there were some students who really prided themselves on their organizational skills. So they wanted to make a checklist to make sure that everyone in the class would know how to write a good book review. Um, I took over the job of the rubric. I decided I wanted to have a scoring rubric to make sure that everyone knew what that review would look like. Um, and then we had poster makers. So these were our um, artists that wanted to, to make posters. Um, we had a student who um, volunteered to write a sample review so that everyone would have a model of what their, their book review might look like. Um, no one signed up for that one. Um, and then we had a group who wanted to make a TV commercial um, to announce the project to the world. So these two students wrote a script and they filmed a commercial um, using their iPad. We, I had one iPad in the classroom at that time. So they just wrote their script and they went out into the hallway and they recorded themselves making this um, commercial. Um, then I had three students who wanted to report on this project. So they wrote an article for our local newspaper um, to tell them what we were up to. Um, and then I had six students who wanted to collaborate to make a song. Um, and we had some artistic differences. So we ended up breaking that up into two songs. So there would be a theme song that would be at the beginning of, the, um, of each episode or each show. Um, and then there was a, a closing jingle um, of a, and they were completely different styles. Um, and the students used um, um, GarageBand. Um, actually, some of the students used GarageBand to make their jingle. And then I also had a keyboard in the classroom. So they were, uh, one of the groups used this keyboard and they actually composed their own song and wrote their own lyrics. Um, to be used for this project. Um, so step four was working out the details. So um, some of the details we didn't, I didn't know what to do. You know, I didn't know, uh, for example, the students really wanted to blog. They wanted to set up a blog. I had never done a student blog at that point. So um, I had to, I worked with our, our tech um, coordinator um, to come up with ideas um, of what I should use. And we decided that Seesaw um, was the best um, platform um, because all of my students could log in separately into Seesaw. Um, and then they could categorize their reviews by genre because that was something the students wanted to do as well. They wanted to make sure that all of these people looking at our blog would be able to understand where these, what kinds of books they were so they could decide if they wanna read them. Um, accountability was important to me as a teacher. Um, and I also had a wide range of um, readers in the class. I didn't want anyone to feel like um, they weren't doing enough or that they, they um, I didn't want anyone to feel overshadowed, right? So I wanted every student's contributions to um, be valued and honored. Um, so for the very first assignment, um, I just assigned to them that they needed to write two book reviews and it could be for any book that they loved. It could be a book that they were currently reading, a book that they just recently finished, um, or a book that they've read and they've loved for a long time. 
I really just wanted to get a spark. I wanted to get everyone on board with how to do this. Um, so I just gave them this little form. I showed them how to get into Seesaw. I gave them time at school to work on it. Um, and they um, they just had to, to post two. So that was, that was the only official assignment that I gave. Um, and then what we ended up doing was um, creating this badging system. So what the students would do, and this, this picture was pre-COVID. <laughs> <laughs> They're all crowded up together to touch that that 30 review badge. Um, so what I did was I just made this color coded star system with paper stars. Um, so for the first review that you wrote on our blog, you would get a white star and we would I would tape it on the student's desk. Um, so it became sort of a, a fun thing to try to, to fill up your desk with all of these stars. Um, and I honestly figured, I actually stopped at the 10 review mark with the badges because I thought it would just kind of peter out and that we wouldn't um, go past a 10 review mark. Um, I was wrong. So I ended up having to go all the way up to a 30 review badge um, because so many students were so um, invested in making this project happen. Um, fitting it in is a bit of a thing. Um, so uh, I, I'm sure that you all have the same experience that um, the school day is busy and filled with all sorts of other things. So I would just sneak time in, you know, sometimes I would take time out of my, my reading schedule. Sometimes I would take out time out of writing. Um, every morning with my students, I did a morning meeting. So I would often tie in the great book reviews into that. Um, sometimes I would assign things for homework just that, that one time at the beginning. Um, and then I also did a lot of independent student work in centers. Um, so sometimes when students, so um, students would get to rotate to a great book review centers to give them an opportunity to work on it at school as well. Oops. <laughs> and then step, I don't even know what this was anymore, um, was I called this embrace the unexpected. Um, so right around the same time that we were starting to put together this idea that the students were going to to make this blog with their book reviews, and then they were going to film themselves reading their book reviews to share them with the world. I happened to go on Twitter, and um, there's a teacher, Marina Doña Poza, who at the time she was living in Malaga, Spain, um, and she was working at an, uh, an international school there. And she was putting together an international um, show that she was putting on YouTube and she was looking for contributors from around the world to give um, segments for her show. So I mentioned it to my students and they, of course, loved this idea. They could not um, stop talking about it. They insisted that we must do it. Um, so this led to us um, reaching out. Um, we are a, uh, an English speaking school, but at our high school, uh, we do have students who are studying Spanish. So I reached out to some of our high school Spanish teachers and I was able to get um, actually three high school students came to work with my students to translate um, two of our shows. Um, so my students would um, read their book reviews in English. Um, and then we had high school students who would translate um, their book reviews into Spanish um, so that we could continue this um, collaboration with this, this class in Spain. It also evolved into, um, we did, a, we set up a flip grid and we started doing book reviews together. Um, and then the book reviews really evolved into Spanish lessons because my students just kept asking how to say certain words in Spanish um, and her students and her colleagues were, were kind of excited to, to do that with us. <laughs> um, and then the other unexpected thing that happened was there um, is an author, a woman who wrote a book that just happened to be published right around the same time that we were doing great book reviews. Um, her name is Chris Aslan. And she, um, 
Oh, this is a YouTube link. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to play that now because I know it's not going to work. <laughs> um, but anyway, she wrote a book and a bunch of my students read her book. So we invited her into our classroom and um, we interviewed her. So one of our episodes of the Great Book Reviews um, show um, was of our students. Um, they did a fake book signing um, with Chris Aslan and they asked her questions about her book. Um, and then they actually got their book signed because so many of my students had ended up buying her book. <laughs> that was definitely not at the beginning of my of my planning. That was an unexpected twist that was so incredibly amazing. Um, but I thought you might want to take a look at what our blog looked like. Um, so I'm just going to click on this. Okay, so we used we used Seesaw. Um, and at the time, I did not even have a paid version of Seesaw. I just used the free version um, that um, you can get just by signing up as an educator. Um, this narrow strip at the top is the custom banner that my artists that you, you, they used um, Google Drawings to create this. Um, it got a little cut off on here, but on the other um, screen that I'll show you in a minute, it, it's a little more pronounced. Um, and they just, uh, these are their book reviews. Um, and then you can see that they tagged them. We created these tags so that when they posted their book reviews, they would have to identify what genre they felt the book fell under. And the students were able to, um, to figure that out on their own. Um, and if we scroll through, you can just see um, this is this was their their blog that they created. Um, and then we also had a YouTube channel. Um, at the time that I established the YouTube channel, we we established it as a branded um, YouTube channel. I'm sure. Um, you have a lot of experience with YouTube out there in this audience. Um, um, but the branded YouTube channels for education accounts um, got discontinued uh, like two years ago. So what I ended up doing is I offloaded um, all of their all of their videos from their YouTube channel into a wakelet just so that we would have them all in one place. Um, and I can share this wakelet with you as well in the chat at the end. Um, at the end here. Um, but there's the full graphic. Um, and this is um, their video. This was their um, the video I tried to show you earlier that didn't quite play um, of them um, reflecting on their experience. Um, this is their interview with Chris Aslan. Um, and then um, episodes four, three, two, one. And this is the commercial that they that they created. <laughs> Okay. Um, and then uh, things could, as if things could not get better, right? Like, so all of this time we are uh, advertising what we're doing in the newspaper. I'm putting it out on Twitter. Um, I've been, I was, you know, we had our YouTube channel. I was talking to parents and telling them where to find all of this great work. Um, and then our Littleton community television um, crew um, invited us to come to their studio so that we could film our final episode actually in a real TV studio. Um, it was just incredible. Um, it's in walking distance of our school. So um, we got a couple of chaperones to walk with us. And we just walked um, over to the, um, the television studio um, and our um, um, our Littleton Community Television staff hosted us to uh, about a, a three hour experience where they gave us a tour um, and they talked to the kids about television um, and then um, recorded an actual episode right there in the TV studio. So at the end of the day, um, it was, it ended up being a four month long project that I really expected to be maybe two or three weeks at best. Um, 
there were 242 blog posts, five official episodes plus two extras, um, and 22 fully engaged students. Um, but really, you know, it comes down to these three big ideas, right? So like I had to trust the process. I had to trust that um, this, I'd be able to manage the chaos um, and get learning out of it. Um, um, I wanted my students to have that experience of an authentic audience. Um, and I really wanted to just lean into the SAMRA model and, and really make it happen and really transform learning for my students. So now, you know, looking back on this, I'm like, well, what did this lead to for me? You know, after taking this big, um, this big risk in my classroom, like how did that change me going forward and changing my approach to teaching going forward? Um, well, I, I also, I have another student, a completely student run YouTube channel called Teach the World. And this channel um, is, um, completely wide open for students at my school to um, teach the world about anything that they think people need to know about. Um, so we're up to, um, we're almost finished with episode nine, um, but we have eight full episodes already. And this is, um, students are creating their videos at home. Sometimes they create them at school with me, but it's all about amplifying student voice so that um, they can, they can experience what it's like to be a creator. Um, I also feel like the uh, maker spaces and the interest in a maker mindset has been amplified in my school community. After this experience, I feel like I have a lot more um, ability to sort of express why it's so important. Um, I have a continued relationship with our Little, Littleton Community Television Group, um, and I have um, some great community support based on um, just this project and then projects that followed after that were modeled after this. So I'd really like to open this time up for comments and questions. I, I, there might be some in the chat. I'm not looking at the chat right now, um, but I think I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see everybody. And then um, I would love to hear what you think. Thank you so much, Heidi. We, uh, we don't have anything in the chat right now, but I want to invite anybody here uh, who has a question for Heidi to, uh, you can turn on your microphone and, and camera if you like. You can also just pop it in, pop a question in the chat if you like, um, and we'll keep an eye there. Okay, I see Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. That it seems like a wonderful space. Um, great. I love that you that you like that. So, so the Teach the World project started as an after school club, actually, um, and then um, it just it's um, sort of morphed itself into our regular school day. So I'm actually collaborating right now with a fifth grade class, um, and. Um, the entire class is going to create um, a segment for our next episode. So um, I love that, you know, that there's teachers who are willing to also bring it into the school day, um, but it's also available to kids to create content outside of school as well. How did you get all of the um, like student permissions required to get them on the TV? That's always a big process, I know, especially in the States. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So I definitely, um, so um, I oh, there's always, you know, someone who maybe isn't able to be on television. So I try to make sure that the projects include um, a way for students to participate, even if they're not going to be on TV. Um, but in this case, every student I had permission, um, assigned permission from, from parents that, that it was okay to do it. Um, but we were really careful. We only used first names. Um, and then if a student if ever felt um, camera shy on a particular day, they didn't have to do it. There was zero pressure at all to do that. Um, and it just kind of, it just kind of happened um, to work out okay. <laughs> But that's always a concern. I totally agree. <laughs> uh, how did you, um, you mentioned that you didn't like the reading log model of accountability. 
how have you continued using this type of engagement with your students since this initial project? Um, great question. So, um, so yeah, so um, I'm no longer a classroom teacher, so I can't totally speak to that. Um, so after that year, after the year of doing great book reviews, I ended up taking a new position, which is basically to manage the two maker spaces in my um, elementary school. So I, I'm at two elementary schools now. Um, so I do tie in reading because part of my mission is to integrate STEM and the maker mindset into our regular curriculum. Um, so my go-to activity for reading is um, um, novel engineering. I, I don't know if that's something that you've you've heard of before, but it came out of some research from Tufts University here in Massachusetts. Um, and what the basic gist of it is, is that um, you read a story with students and I'm talking like your first graders. I just did one with a group of second graders called There Might Be Lobsters. I don't know if you know that book. It's really cute. It's a very, very cute book. Um, but the central character is terrified of lobsters and really worried about going to the beach that there might be a lobster there and then something happens in the story and the they have to get up enough courage to go into the ocean to um, rescue their stuffed animal um, so what i do is i i read the story with kids and then i tell them i ask them who the characters are i want them to think about the characters and then they have to choose one of the characters in the book um, that they want to solve a problem for and then they actually build something physical so I give them materials and they have to build an item and pretend that they're an engineer who can transport into the book and hand that object at their perfect moment <laughs> to that character in the book so with the um with the lobster book I got a lot of rafts um, to so that they could feel they could float above on the water and then I got um, a couple lobster traps <laughs> and nets and things like that um, but the great part about it is that the students are energized by it and um, they they talk about the book they talk about the events in the book they talk about the characters in the book in a really authentic way um, and then they connect it with that uh, that building like you know that physical need to like put things together and use their hands and not be on a screen um, so that's that's something that i've been doing that's been effective for reading <laughs> that's such a simple way to throw a a making activity into uh, into reading. Um, Heidi, uh, and have you, so have you worked directly with Chris Rogers at Tufts? No, I have not. I, I, you're familiar. I, I went to a, um, I went to a conference a couple years back and heard them present. And since then, I just, um, I do it all the time with kids. Awesome. If there, I mean, uh, Chris is one of my old professors, actually. And so, ah. if you do want me to make an introduction, I'm happy to happy to do that. He's a he's a lot of fun. He will make you play it. frisbee uh, if you if you come to one of his meetings, though. So just be ready for that. <laughs> oh my gosh! I had to come all the way to Vietnam to meet someone <laughs> who knows the guy that right next door. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, Heidi, I'm going to pop the link to your your slides in the chat. So anyone who wants to see those slides, you can you can check them out there. And that has obviously links to all the videos and everything. Um, uh, let's let's keep opening it up. Any other questions about questions for Heidi tonight? I'd actually also love to hear like your thoughts, like how how could um, you know, this sort of this mindset of like just putting it all into the student's hands, like how would that translate into your classroom? Because that will help me learn too. Yeah, I mean, my my question, uh, my question is sort of what's what's next? I mean, you've you've done this. Is it continuing? You mentioned another collaboration with a teacher. What's what's the next step for your your media empire? <laughs> A good question. I'll have to come up with a media empire idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, now my focus is really on um, STEM 
um, all day, all the time. So, um, um, and do, and um, with, you know, because of COVID preca precautions, our maker spaces are physically closed this year. So I've been doing a lot of virtual maker space activities. Um, so I do a lot of coding with students, um, 3D printing, because I, I can still, they can still create um, things for the 3D printer and I print it for them and then deliver it. Um, I, <laughs> I just got a laser That's cutter. Great. So yeah, it's working pretty well. Yeah, sometimes, um, so uh, at our school, I could fill you in too. At our school, it's, um, we do have a hybrid model. So our students, half of our students come two days a week and half of our students come the other two days and then on Wednesday in the middle. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Remote learning day. Um, so, so some students, um, but some students are never in the building. So we have a, like a very complicated pickup system. Actually, it's not complicated, but we have a little pickup system for things like that. So when students, when I print out their 3D printing projects, they can come pick them up or I can drop them off. <laughs> it's a great way to add it to the, I mean, I, I can imagine you, the the assembly line of the, the printers working uh -huh. and then I don't know why for me it just I envision a bicycle you with the 3D printed things <laughs> in the back delivering them. I'm sure that's not what it is. That's just that's just me. Well, I do drive a Prius, so it's okay, close. That works. Close to a bicycle. But yeah. Um yep. I mean it's interesting integrating integrating STEM activities into other, uh, mm -hmm. into the subject areas is always a challenge for teachers who might think uh, we're adding something, we're trying to do, throw something else on their plate. Um, what, what other ideas do you have for uh, making it clear that this is something that, that helps them reach their, their goals for the class and not just uh, add another thing in? Yeah, that's a tough sell. You know, I think um, it's, um, I think it's so important, like it's those intangibles of um, being able to invent your own learning, develop your own questions, you know, push forward your own agenda as a student. Um, but sometimes in the busyness of school, that's, that's hard to make time for. Um, but like for the 3D printing example, since we started there, we can, we can talk about that. So um, what I've been doing is I've been putting together these nine week modules. So the 3D printing module has um, three weeks of on demand. I'm doing this all through Google Classroom. Um, so me making videos and you know helping kids get started. So um, it's three weeks of them to um, just whenever they have time to learn how to use Tinkercad. That's the um, program that we use for 3D printing. Um, and then I give them different challenges um, and they, they just kind of it's all about skill building. And then the second phase, the second three weeks is for them to apply their skill to the curriculum. So I meet with the teachers ahead of time and we try to figure out what would make sense. So um, our fifth graders were reading a book called Esperanza Rising. Um, yeah, <laughs> if you know that book, you know that book, it's a good one. Um, so we decided to tie in 3D printing to Esperanza Rising. Um, so what the students had to do was um, they had to create a, um, a character medallion and the medallion, they designed it in Tinkercad um, and they had to put two symbols and a word on it that would represent a character from the book. Um, and then they had to um, uh, go to Flipgrid and explain why they created the medallion that they did, who they created it for, and what the symbols and the word meant. So how that connected to that character. Um, and then if they wanted me to print it, I printed it for them. I printed a lot of character medallions. Um, and they, they looked like little necklaces. They, had, they put holes in them and stuff. And they're, you know, about this big. Um, and then the third phase, the final three weeks, um, is uh, was a passion project. So the students, I had a Google form set up, and the students had to write me a proposal of what they wanted to do with 3D printing and how that was going to connect to their life and why it would be meaningful for them to do it. Um, and then 
I basically approved because I like to say yes to everyone, as you know, from my presentation. So I basically approve every pr um, passion project proposal. Um, so I had students um, using code blocks to create baskets. I had kids that wanted to make the Among Us characters. <laughs> Um, I'm sure that's infiltrated uh, Vietnam as well. Um, and students who just wanted to make something for their little brother or their little sister. Um, and so that was that was a really successful model for me. So I've replicated that model with um, stop motion animation and with coding as well. So three weeks of skill building, three weeks applied to the curriculum, um, and then three weeks of a passion project. And are you working um... Maybe I missed this part. Are you working mm -hmm. directly with individual teachers? Or are you going straight to the students themselves to try to get them into these activities? Um, well, I'm very subversive. So I definitely drop hints to kids all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm very, very subversive. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I meet with the teachers and I and we decide what it's going to be, but then all of the students have access to my, um, we call it the think tank. So I have a think tank Google Classroom um, and everything is there. So the kids, whenever they have independent learning time or honestly, I get um, messages through Google Classroom on weekends, holidays, vacations, at night, because kids want to be doing these things so um, but there's also um, time in the day some for some not every teacher wants to do that and which is totally fine you know it kind of it, it's been working out um, so it's a combination I guess Evan is the answer it's a combination of me being subversive <laughs> It's a great, great model. I mean, <laughs> go straight to the students, you get them excited. I guess part of it is yeah. having that separate virtual classroom space that they can be part of and mm -hmm. learn and and then maybe be the evangelist for your program. Because they say, yeah. I want a 3D print, I want to use stop motion. That's a that's it's a great idea. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's it's been going going pretty well. Any other questions from anybody? Um, we have a stop motion app that we use on the iPad. And I think it will maybe try and set up a similar model with the three week skill, three weeks connected to the curriculum, three weeks of their like passion projects. I think that sounds great. I'm going to see if my, uh, my first grade partner and I can set up something similar to that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I just, I, the three week thing was kind of felt a little arbitrary, but it's probably it's just because the kids don't have contiguous time with it. So I, I just kind of felt like, well, three weeks would give everyone a chance somewhere in that window to at least try it. Um, but they definitely don't need, you know, 40 hours of skill building. It's more like they need two hours of skill building, but like it took three weeks to get that to them. So um, that's awesome. Yeah, stop motion animation is really great. We um, So we ended up tying that into the curriculum with our fifth graders because they were learning about inventors and inventions. So their um, application section, that middle three weeks, was um, they had to pick an inventor or an invention and make a stop motion animation about it. Um, and then the passion projects were really fun. That actually ended up on our Teach the World web, uh, YouTube channel. There's, there's three shows about it on our YouTube channel. <laughs> so that was pretty fun. <laughs> That's very cool. Well, I, uh, as selfish as, as I think we all want to be to continue holding you awake, um, we're about to the end of our time. I want to thank you, Heidi, for, for uh, being part of this. Again, I put the, the slides in the chat. Uh, we'll also see, um, have you figured out how to, how to upload to the Whova site as well, that link? Okay, I we'll figure it out. But I know I need to do that. <laughs> We'll, we'll figure out how to make that happen. I have all the, the resources. Um, okay. Can we as a group just give a virtual round of applause for Heidi and uh, thank you for all your work. Whatever that looks like, we have the reactions, we have our cameras, whatever it is. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you for uh, staying up and, and teaching us um, all you've done with your with your kids. They're definitely lucky to have you.
Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and good luck with the um, return of your students. I, I'm very excited for you. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, we are <laughs> we are returning on Monday. Uh, Hannah, where are you located? Uh, in Hanoi. Hanoi. Yeah. Do you know if you're going back yet? It's not official, but likely Tuesday. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, we're pulling for you for you down here. It's obviously much <laughs> better to have your kids in the classroom. Thank you oh, again. So much better. Yeah. Uh, thank you again, Heidi. It's been great. Um, thank you. Have a good I see night. Jane and Deepa and Hannah. Thank <laughs> you so much. All right. Good night. All right. Bye, everybody. I mean, well, good morning. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.